Indeed, and uh, welcome back. We're still in Cape Town, but our panel has changed slightly. The minister has uh, left us, uh, as well as uh, uh, Ismail Ibrahim, but we do have new guests joining us. And still from the Department of Finance, we have uh, a new Deputy Finance Minister, um, Clevia C. Jonas, uh, who used to be at uh, East, uh, Eastern Cape Government as the MEC Economic Development. A bigger job, um, and I guess uh, an important one. You've had to hit the ground running, uh, uh, Deputy Finance Minister. We'll chat to you just now, but also Razia, thank you very much for carrying on. Uh, she's uh, Head of uh, Africa Research at Standard Chartered Bank, giving us an international perspective of some of the things that we heard yesterday. And also somebody I think is going to be quite busy uh, in the uh, coming months and coming year is the new Commissioner of uh, SA Revenue Service, Mr. Tom Moyami. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and, and welcome to you. All right, let me start with you, Deputy Minister. Um, you've both kind of into this job and you've had to hit the ground running. It's a difficult time to be running this department. What would you say are the biggest challenges that you really need to, to deal with straight away? Well, I mean, obviously, I think the most obvious um, challenge is, is confronting the twin uh, challenges facing the country, which is one, uh, managing and preventing uh, fiscal slippage, which is, in essence, what um, um, uh, the mid-term budget policy statement is attempting to do. But the second one is a broader issue about uh, growing the economy. Mm -hmm. But I think um, we can do whatever we do mm -hmm. um, in terms of fiscal policy. Ultimately, what will take us out of where we are, it's going to be seeing better growth in the economy. Mm -hmm. And it requires a whole range of interventions well, beyond let, fiscal policy. And let's talk about the economy and the forecasts. We've been revising them down quite a bit over time now. Is it that you were over-optimistic before? Or what, why is it that we're constantly revising? What's changing that we're not seeing? Uh, that we're down to one point something and we're trying to get to five? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to get there. But I'm, I, probably that's not uh, only a South African problem. Mm. I think most economies globally are facing the similar challenge. Um, everybody expected uh, after 2008 uh, global recession, everybody assumed that this is going to be short term and markets will hit back and economies will hit back mm. and grow. The reality, um, they've continued to grow slowly and some have continued to decline even further. We're even facing a slowdown in China now. America, despite the strengthening of the American economy, it's very clear it will have huge implications, whatever it does on its monetary policy on developing countries. Europe is still a major drag on the global economy. So everybody assumed, I think if you talk to you know, economists a couple of years ago, I mean, when the, the recession started, everybody thought, well, it's just a cyclical mm -hmm. issue, it will dissipate. The reality is that everybody has to confront the reality that some of these things will continue to be with mm -hmm. us for a very long period, but it's also complicated by our own problems as a country, that mm -hmm. we have our own structural issues as, as South Africa that we have to deal with in order to turn the mm -hmm. economy around. So, yes, we were correct by, by our projections, but realities mm -hmm. are not necessarily cyclical. They have okay. structural basis and they will continue to be with us for a longer period. Yeah. Razia, from what you've heard and what you've been <laughs> observing, how long is it going to take us to get A to the 3% mark they're hoping to get to by 2017, I think it is, but to get up to 5%, how long do you think that's going to take and what do we really need to be doing? And this is undoubtedly the big concern for the South African economy. Pre-crisis, I think we'd all gotten used to the fact that South Africa could grow 5, 5.5%. Some people were worried that maybe it was growing beyond its potential output, that that was very consumption-driven, that it was inflationary. But post-crisis, we've had to consistently revise down our perceptions of what economists might consider a normal rate of growth for South Africa. But if you think of the very real developmental challenges that this country still has, a vast number of people on fairly low per capita incomes, there is this big gap between what we call the median per capita income, what most people would be earning and the average for the country, then it's clear that the economy just has to grow faster. We've seen the growth forecasts, projections that maybe by 2017, thereabouts, we get back to 3%. 
that's just not good enough for South Africa. Given the fundamentals of this economy, given what it has to deliver, there has to be faster growth. And the question is, how does South Africa go about achieving that? Now, we know in terms of the global economy, disappointment everywhere. Disappointment, especially in key trading partners like Europe, that is underperforming. Europe has great structural problems. The aging population, a structure that doesn't necessarily allow for easy solutions, the single currency, everything that goes along with that. But South Africa does need to look further afield. There's been a lot of talk about this incredible growth happening in, in terms of the neighboring countries. Look at the rest of Africa. How does South Africa better leverage off that? I think essentially the problem is one of how externally focused South Africa has been. And clearly what we saw in the early 1990s was an opening up of the economy, but almost a forced opening up when there were questions that could be asked about how prepared the South African economy was. Now I think South Africa needs to embrace that openness in a more conscious way, needs to be more externally focused, needs to be focused on how it's going to boost growth. Okay, all right. Uh, the newest kid on the block, uh, Commissioner uh, Moyani. Um, when we talk about uh, this re-engineering that needs to take place and, and how we do uh, the business of South Africa, I guess your department has also uh, got quite a lot of work to do. The um, minister has talked about needing to find money, needing to find revenue, but at the same time, uh, the, mindful of the burden of the average citizen. So I guess part of your challenge is you're going to have to find money in other ways as well, perhaps being more efficient and perhaps even there's people that are probably still flying under the radar that you need to find. How do you see your role in getting or reducing this, uh, this deficit and getting this money in? Well, ours, we as a revenue service of South Africa, we're in the end of the value chain, mm -hmm. merely to implement policy of state, but most importantly to collect as much revenue as possible in order to provide the state with the sufficient revenue to be able to implement policies that co are concomitant to the issues of development, building of schools, hospitals, and all the services that we're looking for. It is going to be difficult, but I'll bait that. What is most important is that um, that is what you call a good citizen, as the minister had indicated, that we all need to pay our taxes. It's going to be tough, but what is necessary is that in this contraction that we've seen in the economy, the global impact that it has on our economy, SARS has a responsibility at the end of the day to deliver the target that the state has set. Because if we fail, then we'll not be able to achieve some of the programs that the state has set itself in the National Development Program. So the onus is on us, with the team that we live, and also the population of South Africa, that we need to pay our taxes across the board, both private and individual companies that are operating in our economy, so that we do have that amount of money in our fiscals. So what do we do? Because there's, you know, people look out the window and they see some people running little businesses and they don't seem to be part of this tax thing. And I'm Joe Citizen, I'm working in a factory and they're taking a little portion of my, my, my money away. How do we make sure everybody gets caught in this net? The most primary importance that SARS has to play in these difficult conditions is tax education. Tax education plays a very pivotal role. That is a societal responsibility, but equally, tax education must provide a roadmap that indicates what are the importance of paying taxes as citizens of this country. Yes, we do have, in any economy whatsoever, those who are not paying their taxes, and therefore it's important that we deal with the illicit economy. People who are deviant, um, provisions that they do in relation to what they're expected to be doing. That you find both in individuals and companies. So there are a number of things that we're looking into which will influence or, or say the, at, the policy, at the policy level that it is important that everybody, small business, has a role. But because of the squeeze that they have, we need to have incentives that create the, the onerous position wherein all these people are able to pay their taxes on time. But it is a huge responsibility that we have, 
but it's not something that is not surmountable. Okay, all right. So I'm sure we're going to get a few more questions on that. But let's go straight to our tables now and start at table number six with Mike Lowe. And don't forget, at home, you can also tweet uh, at Morning SABC, <coughs> hashtag TNA Biz Brief, and we'll pick up your questions there as well. Mike? Okay. Um, unfortunately, Mike Lowe has just stepped outside. Oh, okay. But I'll take his <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, my name is Lutando Nutkunisa. I'm from Kosatu. Just one question that I would like to ask uh, the panel. The minister spoke about capping the, the wage bill at a certain percentage. Wouldn't that undermine the collective bargaining process? And we also want to understand the government has a an objective of building a capable developmental state. But if you cut posts and you don't fill vacant posts in the public service, how is that going to contribute towards building the developmental state that we all want? Thank you. All right, okay. Uh, answer for you, maybe you can follow up on that. Okay, okay. Uh, um, um, Lieutenant, without uh, making this a bargaining platform, <laughs> <laughs> which is possible, <laughs> I think, uh, broadly, I think, let's deal with it at a principle level. I think the, the argument is that um, uh, we cannot continue to grow our wage bill um, at a rate at which we're growing it. And it's a general principle. All governments uh, everywhere are concerned about managing their wage bill. And if you go to some of the provinces, the wage bill is al already sitting at 61%, even more in some other provinces. Mm. There are provinces where the wage bill is sitting at 70% uh, of the total budget. Now that's dangerous, because what it implies is that you are actually literally shifting resources from the actual development projects and financing an ever-growing uh, wage bill, which is never in any case managed. That's important. So that's the principled position. And I think we're saying uh, uh, from where we're sitting, if we're lowering uh, the expenditure ceiling, the wage bill becomes a, a major risk. So we must manage it um, incrementally over time, deal with that challenge. The second point probably that's important to make is that there, there's an assumption that there is a correlation between um, the size of the wage bill and productivity. The truth of the matter, and uh, we, there's all research, and I'm sure you concur with me. There is no cor cor correlation. Mm. So what has happened is that in the public sector, we've grown the wage bill without growing productivity. Mm. And that's probably, again, another, probably the worst anti-developmental act that we can do. So part of what we're talking about is not just managing the wage bill, it's also managing productivity, so that you enhance and build capacity within the public sector, mm so that you build the capable state. So the capable state, it's not a question of numbers. It is not the question of the size of the wage bill. It is the question of what capacity do you, bring, do you build within the state? Whether the state can plan development, whether the state can, can, can finance development, whether the state can manage the projects that it's supposed to manage, whether the state can implement projects. I'm sure you'll agree with me where we are as we speak we probably are weak in all those areas. Mm. So the wage bill is one component of it, but I think we need to take a more holistic view on the issue and say building the capacity of the state must include, amongst other things, managing the cost of delivery, which includes some of the things that we're talking about, about wage bill lowering, etc. It also must include building capacity in critical areas like project management, et cetera, et cetera. But it also must also relate to enhancing productivity generally in the public sector. We have a huge challenge as we speak. Mm. So we are not opening the, the, the bargaining process. I'm just raising <laughs> principled <laughs> issues that are broadly standard right. in, in development. But you can't too. afford to go above inflation increases. Look, I mean, it will be unrealistic to do that, but again, we are not bargaining. Okay. We're just stating a principled position. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs>
<laughs> Maybe if I can come in with yeah. something of an external perspective on that question and this very crucial issue about how the South African state fills that developmental aim. The way the rest of the world are looking at the South African economy is that savings are pretty low, there is a need to ramp up investment, investment in infrastructure especially, if the economy is going to be able to grow faster. And this is where the government probably faces a choice. Up until now, there have been healthy increases in that wage bill. And questions are starting to be asked about the sustainability of it all. Debt ratios have come up awfully quickly, partly because the growth environment has been weak. But investors are looking at these debt ratios and saying, is South Africa, the sovereign, still as creditworthy as we used to assume? Is it still investment grade? Um, we know that there have been pressures looking at how quickly that debt ratio has built up. The worry here is that if the government is spending a lot more on the public sector wage bill, there isn't going to be enough left over to spend on those elements of spending where growth would be enhanced and you could see the benefits for all. If you take a bigger picture view, the countries that have managed to sustain 7% type growth rates over decades were all countries where savings were significantly higher as a percentage of GDP. Yes, we've seen the flip side of it. Investment tends to be high, but that was only possible because they were able to raise the national rate of savings. I'm not sure this is a debate that is often taken mm. on board in South Africa. Mm. What does South Africa really want to be? What is the the longer term vision for the economy. There is a choice facing the government, of course. And if the spending is going to be on consumption, if it's going to be about giving in to higher wage demands, then maybe there's something bigger and much more important and much more potential that is really being taken away from South Africa. We do think that's an important part of the debate and there needs to be recognition about exactly what economic future South Africa might be giving up in seeing to significant wage demands in the near term. Mm. Uh, uh, of course, of course I, must, I must add, I mean, that I think there is a broad consensus um, in South Africa that we must shift our economy uh, from a consumption-driven economy to a production-driven economy. I mean, that, that's broadly accepted by everybody. What it implies from a government perspective is we need from, a gov from the, our own resources and everything else that we can do to catalyze investment in the productive e economy. And part of that means that uh, we must sustain the infrastructure spend. It also means that we must continue with our industrial development programs. The special economic zones um, must be implemented as quickly as possible. We must also grow the skills in our economy, etc., etc. But broadly, we must also try to work towards building a broader partnership that is focused on driving the growth of the productive economy. And unless we do that, mm. and I, I wanted to add one point on this issue of, of, of growing um, the, the wage bill. You know, there are things that we can do consciously on our own. But if we don't do them over a prolonged period, one day somebody will come and do it for us. And when that happens, I don't think it will be nice. And we have countries all over the world that lost their economic sovereignty simply by mismanaging their fiscal resources, mismanaging their economy. So it's a very hard choice that as a country we must face in the eye and deal with it. Otherwise, the alternative is too ghastly to contemplate. All right, okay, we're going to contemplate and uh, think about that. <laughs> and I'm going to have a drink of water because I'm about to cough. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be back right after this. <laughs> 